Not much left for me to do, amen? Some of you said, oh boy, we can go home early. Came to the wrong place. I don't know how to break that to you. But we do have some good news for you. We have a, the, the Word of God, amen? amen? And the thing about the Word of God is, uh, it's one of those things sometimes we're afraid to see it. We're afraid that it's going to tell us that we're not good enough. Has anybody ever brought you the good news that turned out not to sound so good because it told you you weren't good enough? But that's the way you heard it. What's the great thing about our God? He says, I got that. He says, I've got that. I will make you good enough. And I'll make you good enough because I love you so much. I, I, I'm not going to allow uh, anything but success. That's the only way that it can happen. And how do you get in on that thing where God loves you that much and will do whatever it takes to legitimately help you make the decision to be in heaven? Romans 10, 9 will do it. And it says what? Confess with your mouth that He's your Lord, your ultimate authority, the one I'm going to follow. Right? And believe in your heart, God raised you from the dead, and you will be saved. That's a direct quote. That's not the editorializing or anything. You will be saved. What does that mean? It means that you'll go to heaven. It means that you're part of the family. It means you're part of the kingdom of God. And when we sing majesty, you know which king we're talking about. We're talking about your king. And, and you're not his subject so that he can be better. He's fine. He's your king so that he can take care of you and help you grow into the most that you could possibly be. That's the good news. Does the good news get confused sometimes? Does the good news get twisted sometimes? Does the good news, is, is it sometimes been used to manipulate people? Of course it has. We have a, an enemy, and an enemy that doesn't want you to hear good news. He wants you to hear things that make you run away from the way to heaven. He wants you to join him in punishment forever. Why? I don't know. It's kind of sick. Isn't it? But it's, it's, almost, it's almost insane that Jesus would do so much to help us get to be with him. But he will because of this strange motivation called love. And he's the author of our faith, but he's also the definition of love. If you want to see what love looks like, look to God. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Today's 9-11. We know what happened 15 years ago. And people have asked, well, why did that happen? Why did God allow that to happen? What, what about all these things? Well, just a, a quick thing about that. Did God create sin? God didn't create sin. You know what God gave us? Choice. And if He gave us choice, because there's no other way to love somebody except by choice. Did you know that? If somebody points a gun and say, say you love me, go ahead and say it. You know? But do you mean it in your heart? No, you mean it in your feet. You want to get out of there, right? You want to get through this and survive. But, but can you coerce somebody to love you? No, they may say it. They may do things that, 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 that are aligned with love, but, but it's not love, right? To, to have genuine love, you have to have a genuine choice. And so God offers us the ability to make a decision to love Him back or to reject Him. The problem is, is when we reject God's best way, we're rejecting the best way. We're rejecting good, and what's the opposite of good? Bad and evil. And so this evil of not doing it God's way is called sin. So did God create sin? No. He gave us the dignity of having choice, and then we choose to not take the best and the most loving and the most powerful way. And the most promising way, but we choose the evil side because anything less than the best is going to be evil. And that's how sin got created. So we got to deal with it. Now, did God come into the world so that he could condemn everybody? Did God step into the world in flesh, into our history, as Jesus Christ, so that he could condemn the world? He said, I came not into the world to condemn the world because it was already condemned. It needed help. It needed a rescuer. We use the term, we've used it so much, we forget what it means. We needed a rescuer. We say Savior. And he was willing to put his life on the line. I just put it on the line because on the line means it may fall over there. He was willing to give his life so that we could be saved to what? Heaven. Saved from what? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Saved from Daryl for me. Because Daryl, with his free will, has often made the wrong choice. 
And the Bible says that every one of us has says, for all have sinned, made the wrong choice, and come short of the glory of God. And so we needed a rescuer. The good news is we have a rescuer. The bad news is many of us won't reach and take his hand. And how do we do that? Confess you your mouth, he's your Lord. From now on, you're my ultimate authority, God. Believe in your heart, God raised from the dead. It's not just a religious talk thing, not lip service, but mean it in the center of who you are, and you will be saved. If you haven't done that, please don't let the sun go down before you do. Why would you not want to be part of the kingdom of God for eternity? So please don't do that. You can confess with your mouth, let somebody know. You can read it. God's word right here from Brother Darrell. From God's word, Romans 10 9. You can find it right there on the wall. You can find it on our website. It is everywhere. Now, there's other verses that tell how to do it. I just love that Romans 10 9 tells you exactly what to do. Step by step. Amen? Now, once you are saved, once you are saved, do you sit down and show up for church every Sunday to be good little Christians? I'm, I'm, I say it that way because I'm afraid that's how many people think. Well, as long as I show up for church on Sunday morning, God's happy with me. I'm good. I've done my penance fully. You know, and we get that, that idea. That's not why God says together together. God says get gathered together to get equipped to go out and help other people not die and go to hell. How many of y'all have friends that you want to see go to hell? Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> I often do, and I know I have good job security, but whatever took place over here, I'm sure it was interesting, I'll hear about it later. But uh, pray for them. And by the way, they pray for you. Wonderful prayer for you. You weren't pointing at me, were you? Uh, anyway. Uh, does anybody have a friend they want to see go here? Who did God see? Listen, he's... God came himself to make a way for them to go to heaven. Who did he send into their life that they might know the way to heaven? Huh? You, the church. Everyone who's already going, he sent. And, and Paul says, you know what? It's become the most important thing in my life is helping people stay out of hell and get to heaven. And so, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, here's what he says. For though I am free from all means, because I'm, I'm not a slave, I'm a free man. In other words, I have free will. I can make my decisions where to go and what to do. I have made myself a servant to all. The super apostle Paul has made himself a servant. Who would be crazy enough to have a, a, a place of high rank and make themselves a servant to everybody around them? Oh yeah, it's our majesty that would do that, amen? Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to do what? Serve. He didn't come to be rescued, but to rescue. He didn't come to, to, to make himself better. He can't get better than, than God. Right? He came to save us. From who? Ourselves and our bad choices. That's what he came to do. Amen? So he says, though I am free, I give my freedom to God and I give up my freedom for you. That's what I'm doing with my free will. That's pretty amazing. That's downright Christ-like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that, that we will see, Father, not only the great, amazing gifts that you've given us, but Lord, also the, the precious privilege of responsibility to help those, Father, that don't know, Lord, that there's help available and that they don't need to know that they need it sometimes. Some of them have believed, believed the lie that, that for some reason they're inferior. And it's a lie from, from the enemy. Lord, don't let us fall to the lies of the enemy. He's told them to us for way too long. And you said the truth will set us free. And the truth is you, Lord Jesus. So we pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm free, but I've decided to make myself a servant for others. So that what? He might win. Now, for a Christian, what is winning? By the way, if you're a Christian, you've already won. Did you know that? You have victory in Jesus. You're going to heaven if you're a true Christian. The Bible says, when Jesus said it this way, nothing can snatch them out of my hand. Nothing. Okay? So, you've already won. So, but you're still in the game. What are you trying to win if you're still in the game? 
He says, bear fruit that will last. Last how long? For eternity. We're here to make eternal differences in the people around us. That, that's, our, that's our purpose. We may pick other tangents to go, and you may do it from your place of work, you may do it from your place of play, you may do it as you go. That's, that's our job. That's our great calling. That is the great commission. He says, I'm going to serve because I found out that people won't believe me. Won't believe me until they know how much I care about them. When I tell them that they can have better. He says, and to the Jew, it says to the Jews, he said, well, when I was with the Jewish people who had the Jewish culture, who, you know, uh, did their, their, their certain holidays, holy days, and, and did this and that. He said, what did he do? He said, oh, guys, you don't need to do all that. You need to listen to Paul. Paul knows way better how to live than you do. You come because I'm the super apostle. Is that what he said? No, he went in their house and did what? He observed their customs. Why did he do that? To honor them. He was their servant. Amen? That, that's what he did. And he says, I, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. They won't listen to me if they think I don't care and honor them. And so that's what he did. To those who are under the law, as under the law. Listen, the law won't save you. We'll just point out that we come up short. <laughs> Amen? But there are people who diligently try to follow the law to show themselves approved. Do we still follow this? If you're following Jesus, would Jesus break the law? No. So if we're following Jesus, we're going to keep the law, but not because it's written here, but because we're following Jesus. Right? But to those who have these customs that follow the law and all, absolutely, he would go right along with them and do what they said. They said, we're the, the, the uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the terminology. I know we were in Israel, we had to wear them, we go to the Wailing Wall. And then they were to cover their heads when they prayed. We did that because we were there. We were in their house. Right? And he says, so I'm going to honor him when I'm there. She so says, it's under the law that I meant might win those who are under the law. I'm going to do what it takes to let them know that I honor them and I appreciate them to help them move forward. To those who are without the law, he's talking to, to the Gentiles who didn't know all the Jewish customs from Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all those places. He said to those, I'm going to show them the freedom that we have in Christ. I'm going to live with them. I'm going to enjoy the things that they enjoy. Uh, and one of the things that it says in the Bible, and I've shared this with you before, it says, don't cook a kid that's a baby goat in its mother's milk. And it tells you that back in, uh, in Numbers. That's under the law. Now, what that was, it was a pagan ritual. And what, what he, was, he was telling them is, don't live as the pagans, so those who don't know God. Don't follow their stuff that's honoring a false god. Okay? But, but some of the Jewish people have taken that so far that they won't eat. Well, they, they couldn't have breakfast with us for a couple of reasons. And on the men's breakfast, one, we eat pork sausage. That would be following the law, not to eat pork, right? And number two, we make milk gravy with it. They would eat dairy and meat on the same plate because of that one thing saying, stay away from the culture that, that doesn't look to God. It didn't say stay away from the people. It said stay away from following the culture. Okay, does that make sense? Don't go into pagan ideas that don't honor God, but actually dishonor God. But the, the legalists, they wouldn't have, for example, they wouldn't have a steak and baked potato that had butter or, whipped, or uh, sour cream on on the same plate. You had to put on a different plate. That's how legalistic they were. Now, to the Gentiles who weren't up there, hey, all the uh, sour cream you want on your potato with your steak, if you can afford steak. You know, that wasn't the problem. So he said, when I was with them, I didn't say, oh, no, the Jewish law says do this. He said, we are free in Christ. And you can read several of those things. Chapter 14 of the book of Romans tells you a lot about the freedom that you have in Christ. Amen? So, what did he do with, with them? He said, if they're without the law, not being without the law towards God, but under the law towards Christ. In other words, he said, not under all these written rules, but under the freedom of Christ and following Him. He said, I go and live in that freedom so that I might do what? Win some of them. From what? From dying and going to eternal hell to going to eternal heaven. And I can't tell you what's in heaven because I hadn't seen, you hadn't heard, the heart hadn't come up with the things that God has made for those that love Him. It's that good. I can tell you what it won't be. It will not be boring. If you think that the God who spoke creation in six days with the thousands of just colors green. How many different colors green are we? We talked about that all the time. The different hues and all that. That's just one color. 
how imaginative is our God? Scientists are still trying to figure him out. They call that uh, science. Amen? As they try to figure out nature and how things work and how the, the, uh, the uh, solar systems work and all those other kind of things. Right? They're still trying to figure out. So we have an amazing, imaginative God and he's got things prepared for us that our language can't even share. It's going to be awesome. So that's what we're trying to win people to. And that's what, by the way, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life and you've been in your heart, You've already won. We're trying to make more winners. He said to the weak, I became his weak. He didn't walk by and say, I'm glad I'm not like you. Let me show you what I can do. He didn't do that. He went and sat down with him. He says, I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Wait a minute. We have to be careful with that line. I have what? Become all things to all men that, I, by, that by all means I might save some. Where are we reading this? Who is the Lord of Paul's life? Jesus Christ. So, by all means, does that mean if, if there's a heroin addict, he's going to go shoot up with him so he might save him? It does not mean that. Because that would not be in the character of Jesus Christ. Okay, look at the context. He says, but as far as I can go to reach somebody without getting into the curses with them, I can go to places, but I'm not going to partake of sin. Where did Jesus go? To whoever. He went, listen, he went and hung out with tax collectors. How many of y'all have good buddies that you like to see pretty regular who are tax collectors? And these tax collectors work on commission. And they got to set the commission themselves. I, I got some friends who are tax collectors. They don't work on commission. You know, but they got to set it. And if you didn't do what they said, they could call a Roman soldier and he'd beat you up. And Jesus went to those to save them. To, to ladies of bad reputation. He didn't join them in things of bad reputation. He brought them from that to where? The kingdom of heaven to be a child of the king. So when we're saying that, does that mean you can go do anything that you want as long as you can put it on the head? I'm here to reach some lost souls. That's not what it means. He says, this is why I do it. I, I do this for the gospel's sake. What the good news is sake. For, for the promise of what God has to offer. I do it for that. That's become my reason, my purpose, my mission in life. Is to help rescue people. Remember, y'all heard the Cajun Navy? They jumped in their boats and they went to do what? Save people from, from the floodwaters that were coming. That's what they went to do. Did they ask for reimbursement when they got there? We'll take you if you'll give us some money for gas and, and, and all those kind of things. Did they, did they do that? That's not what they did. They went and they did it because that became the most important thing that day, that moment, was to help people. What's Paul trying to do? Help people because it's the most important thing. It's like everything else pale in comparison to somebody drowning. And, and the Cajun baby going to get them out of their house and get them to where they go. You saw one that, that went down back under the water to rescue a dog out of a farm. You know, that, that, that's going for it, isn't it? Amazing stuff, you know, that they did. How much more is it when you're trying to rescue someone from eternal hell and bring them to eternal heaven? And Paul says, once you see this, how can you look the other way? And, and he had to give up pride. Paul was highly educated. Right? Studied at the feet of Gamaliel, who was considered the, the, the great professor of religious law. You know? He, he would race high in rank in, in the religious order of the day. What did he do when he got to Corinth, to the city of Corinth, when the book of 1 uh, Corinthians? What did he do? He said, hey, I'm the preacher here. Let's pass the offering plate. And I'm watching to see how much you put in. Is that what he did? He said he wouldn't take a dime from him. He wouldn't take a dime from him. He went and he made tents. Pretty much they made tents out of leather. Anybody ever sewed leather by hand? It just work. But he was a tent maker. He said, I'm doing this so you'll know that I'm here for you, not for your money. Now some others, like in Philippi, we're studying the book of Philippians your Brother Matt's right now. They heard about his mission and they said, Hey, Paul, you didn't ask us, but we're going to help support you while you're there. 
And he called partners in doing these things. We've got the special offering coming up to help these other uh, missions. That's When we have those special offerings, that's not where any administration or anything else comes out. That goes directly, 100%, to those actual missions. And so that's why we have those every four months. Once for the state missions, once for the North American missions, once for the worldwide missions. And, and listen to what you put in there, what the Lord lays on your heart. That's it. Because that makes you a what? A partner in helping rescue more people. That's what it's about. That's what the, the city of uh, Philippi, the church of Philippi, done. he says, I do it for the good news of sake that I might be a partaker of it with you. He says, we're partners in rescuing people. Only he didn't call that group the Cajun Navy. He called it the uh, church. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The flood waters won't beat the church. The gates of hell can't beat the church. If we're doing what? We're God's senses and has us to do what he did. Well, we have to be careful. I'm going to come back. There's only about three or four verses left in chapter 9, but I'm going to move over to chapter 10 real quick. I need to tell you all something else. Here's a big secret not many people know. Did you know that when Paul wrote these epistles, this part of the Bible, and when Matthew wrote, and Mark wrote, and Luke wrote, and John wrote, did you know that when they wrote that, they didn't put those little numbers in there? Did you know that? They didn't have chapters. They just wrote as the Holy Spirit led them to write. And so we have an artificial chapter 10 put in there, but it's still attached to chapter 9 because there wasn't a chapter 9, chapter 10. It was a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to be sure that we all got. So I'm going to move over to the artificial numbers, chapter 10, verse 1. And I want to show you it does not mean go and live any way you want and claim that you're doing it to reach others. We have to live in such a way that they know we're following Christ because if they don't know we're following Christ, how can they? If they don't see a direction, how could they follow? So he's talking to me, says this. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness years ago. He's talking about whenever they got the people out of Egypt, Noah's time, and they're bringing them through the wilderness towards the promised land. About our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. All of them walked through the sea on dry ground. When the Red Sea parted, they walked not on muddy ground. How long did it take after the flood for your ground to dry? <laughs> part of the miracle was not just the water part, but part of the miracle was they were on dry ground. You take a million people walking on a muddy spot, it gets worse, doesn't it? How many of y'all had mud tracks in your yard for a while after the flood? And the more traffic people come check on you have, the bigger the mud hole got, right? Imagine a million people walking. The, one of the part of the rivers is dry ground. In the cloud in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. There was a picture of baptized. We're all in. We've all shared the same experience. We've seen what God can do. We know what it is. We're, we're baptized into a church, right, in the name of the, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because of our, our profession of faith in Jesus. But we've all been through, all, all who are members here have been through that experience of baptism. And, and we know what it's about. We know it, it's not about the, the water saving We know it was about we were saved, showing everybody we were alive to self. We died to lead our own lives. So Jesus could lead it. We were buried, going under the water. And then we rose to walk in the newness of life as Jesus as our leader. And it shows everybody that we've made that decision. He says, you've had a shared experience through, through this water. The cloud by day, right? And walking on this dry land. It says all of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them got the manna from heaven. A lot of them, when they got to the other side, when they had endured being chased down by Pharaoh and his army, then they watched Pharaoh uh, destroys in the sea, his army destroyed in the sea. Then they got over there and said, boy, they sang songs, they had a big party. We were rescued from Pharaoh, and they turned around and they saw a big desert. And what was their next thought? God, you brought us out of here so we could die in the desert? It's God stupid? <coughs> it's taking y'all too long to think about that. Let's try it again. Is God stupid? Amen. Of course not. He's not stupid. Then why did they think that he brought them through such a horrible place so that they could die in the next chapter? Why did they think that? How many of us think that sometimes? How many times have we, how many of y'all been delivered by God from various events in your lives? Why did God bring you through to drop you? That's not God. Amen? 
It's not God. And so they got there, and when they got there, what do you do? God, we have nothing to eat. What are we going to do? And, and all of a sudden, he sent food from heaven called man. And boy, when you first read about it, they could cook it up a thousand different ways. They, it was the best thing uh, before sliced bread. They didn't slice bread back then. Right? It was the good stuff. Later, they got tired of it and started complaining about it. But it was the good stuff. And every morning it was new and it was fresh except for the day of worship. And he gave them enough the day before that they would have enough for two days. But it was new and fresh. And they got to depend on God's grace fresh daily. How about up our learning to depend on God's fresh grace for today and tomorrow there will be some more. Some of us think worldly. We think we're going to use it all up. We better store some. You don't have to with God. God's got plenty. The problem is we go where it's not. Okay? He said, and, and y'all, when we were going through the wilderness, y'all drank from the same spiritual water. It came out of a rock. You remember that? Speak to the rock. Tap the rock. Whatever he told him to do, he gave him different things. And in the middle of a dry, dead desert, water would come out of a rock. Now, generally, in, in, in this part of the country, you dig in the ground a ways. Anybody ever dug a well? We went 38 feet one time in sandy soil. You know the problem with sandy soil? It's 38 feet. The well wasn't that big around. We were digging it by hand. A little bitty auger about that big. It's when you would get in that, that little bit of sand in the bottom. It was kind of wet. By the time you pulled it up 38 feet, you had about that much sand still in it because it all fell back down. So we dig the same three feet probably 20 times before we finally got down there and you drive the spud in and you have a, a well that you can pump out of. Never seen water come out of a rock on the side of you. That's kind of strange, isn't it? Who, who caused that to happen? But in, in the desert, water is life. You add water out there and suddenly it's green and lush. You take it away and it's brown and dead. Who is our rock? And who can give life in the driest of places? Our Lord Jesus. It was a picture. He said, you've experienced that. Says, and he says, literally, he says, all of them drank the same spiritual water. And they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock was who? Jesus, who gives life? Jesus. He says, remember, come for the living water and you won't thirst anymore. Our problem is we wander away from the living water. <clears throat> Yet God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies scattered in the wilderness. What? God wasn't pleased with most of them and they, they, they died instead of living. They had manna from heaven. They had water. You know, in the desert, which is life, and they died out there amidst plenty. God's grace was available. God showed how much He loved them and wanted to rescue them and get them to a better place, and they died right in the middle of plenty. Can we do that? Can we starve ourselves to death in the, uh, from grace in the middle of God's wonderful, amazing, saving grace? It's right there. Uh, we talked the other night about spiritual uh, anorexia. Anorexia is a horrible disease. The, the strange thing about it is what? It's people starving themselves to death with food right there. And they develop an aversion to the food. Do we sometimes develop an aversion to the life giver? We stay away in droves? If you were to go in our, around our community, would there be more? Uh, we've got plenty of churches in this little town. Did you know that? I live a block away. There's three churches closer to my house than this one. Amen? Are we going to find more cars in the church parking lots or in the driveways? We can, we can have spiritual anorexia and we can die and develop an aversion to God's grace when it's all over and it's abundant. God was not pleased with both of them and their bodies. They chose death instead of life or scattered in the wilderness. These things happen as a warning to us so that we wouldn't crave the evil things as they did. Oh, I've got this man of it. Look how good they're eating over there. That sure looks good way over there. Oh, I remember what we had back when we were in slavery. Oh, if we could just get back in slavery so we could have that good food. Does that even sound right? Yeah, but that's, that's how we think us, us humans with our broken brains. We broke them in the fall. Anybody remember about the fall back in the Garden of Eden when man fell from grace? He said, these things happen to warn us so that we wouldn't do the evil things that they did. Or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. Could, could it be that in America, if 
founded on Christian principles. They say Judeo-Christian principles. You know what that is? It's a simple say, way of saying what? <coughs> the Old Testament Judeo, the New Testament Christian. So what was our principles that we, we settled uh, in the, the United States on? The principles. I didn't say we got it perfect. What was it? It was God's way. And when you go back and look at the founders and the signers and all that kind of stuff, you find immensely well-studied Christian people who understood that. They understood dignity came from having free will, having choice. And so freedom was the overall idea of getting away from these monarchies where it was all about serving your king and moving to a place where you could serve your God who had already shown that he wanted to serve us. And instead of looking back and say, oh, we, we wish we could go back to slavery and have what they had, they said, you know what, we will take the personal responsibility and move on towards God. And instead of observing the pagan ways of, of false gods and idols and all that kind of stuff, we will look to the straight and narrow way. People say, oh, straight and narrow, sure sounds boring. If you're going on a long trip, how many of you want to go this way? Especially if you're walking. How do, how do you want to go? As straight as you possibly can. You save a lot of energy and, and you're most efficient, right? Who wants to go straight to God's best? Or who wants to say, no, I want to be through. I don't want God's best. That would be fun. Straight to God's best. And how many of you are waiting to die to get to, to be a kingdom citizen? That's the one we got. When did your eternal life start? The day that you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, your eternal life started with Him as your King. Don't wait for eternity to get here to start living. God's given us life now. Amen? And, and pagan ideas. Pagan ideas. Worship Bible say that the Scriptures say that people celebrate with feasting and drinking and they indulge in pagan revelry. What happened to America that we used to look to God and it was, it was a, a wonderful thing to talk about a good Christian home? And now if you say it, if you say it in front of the media, oh, they're one of them. What's the, 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 the something clingers, I forget what they say, to their Bibles and their millions or whatever. They, they, they come up with all those kind of ideas, one of those. They've been indoctrinated. They've been this, they've been that. Listen, as a public school teacher for 25 years, if I taught you kids about Islam, everybody was fine. If I talk about Buddhism, everybody is fine. If I talk about Hinduism, everybody is fine. But if I brought up Christianity, I had to be very, very careful. I was on thin ice. And especially when I became a pastor. Why? The nation was founded on what? Following God. And it's crazy stuff like don't kill and don't steal and don't commit adultery and don't do these kind of things. Don't do things to hurt one another and keep God first because He's the one who can provide the manna. And the living water. But what has happened? Instead of bringing others in and helping them find Jesus, we said to the others, you come in and, and, and we, won't, we won't hurt your feelings by saying we believe in the Supreme God. We won't hurt your feelings that way. What happened? We didn't say they could worship their God, but we're not even allowed to tell them now about our God. What happened? 9-11, what was God? Was he allowed in those buildings? There were godly people in those buildings. Godly, precious people that died in those buildings. But do you think that somebody could say, hey, we're going to have a Bible study during coffee break. Anybody want to come? Somebody would have got their feelings hurt, called the lawyer's office and the ACLU or whatever, and, and they could have been a lawsuit right there. You could have lost your job. But you could talk about what? Politics? You could talk about a sports team? You could talk about any of those other things. Don't bring up whose name? Jesus. Don't do it. So where was God pushed away in our free will? What did we say in our nation? Listen, about 3,000 people died that day. That is horrible. 15 years ago, there were precious people in people's lives. They were at the dinner table, going to be there for Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that, and they haven't been there for 15 years. It is horrible. Let me tell you something horrible. Tomorrow, if the average holds up in the United States, about 3,000 unborn babies are going to be killed. Don't talk about it, though, because you will be considered one of those, you know, those people. About 3,000 unborn babies are going to be killed tomorrow. 
We can talk about 9-11 a little bit. Don't go too far. Don't show pictures. But don't you bring up those unborn because it's people's right to get rid of those if they're an inconvenience. And I know people say, what about incest and rape? Small, tiny, tiny percentage of that. About 900 of those would be killed by Planned Parenthood. Which who funds? The government. What has happened? And he says, what? You're in the promised land? Don't go do the pagan things. Is it a Christian thing to kill these babies? It's not a Christian thing. And nobody's having a big day. And listen, I'm going to say a big day, a big memorial day for the 3,000 that will die tomorrow, and another 3,000 Tuesday, and another 3,000 Wednesday. In the United States, there's a lot more than that around the world. What are we setting ourselves up for? When we join in and participate, you say, well, that's the government. Let's, let's keep on about the government. The Bible says there are certain sexual things that, that are wrong. Here's the best, and here's the bad things. And, and you know what? You can't talk about these things if you're what? You're not politically correct. But the, the term same-sex same -sex marriage would be an oxymoron 40 years ago. You, how could you have same-sex marriage in the same sentence? It wouldn't work. And people are free. Listen, I'm not speaking. Some people say, you're just condemning. I'm saying, I am not. I love these people. I love the babies. I love the moms who have been led or misled to the wrong choices. I love every one of them. And you know what? I got my own sins. And I need my rescuer daily. But I'm glad somebody told me at some point, Darryl, if you don't have Jesus, you're going to die in your sins. Have we joined in? Uh, the army just said that, that uh, you can kind of choose your gender when you get in the army that you want to be. And if you don't like your, your anatomy the way it is, we'll pay to get it changed. Who's going to pay for that? It's called transgender and all those kind of things. We wouldn't even, this would be crazy talk 40 years ago. But they decided it's politically correct and don't say anything against it. And what he says is, God... Boy, did you mess up on me? I was supposed to be a this, or I was supposed to be that. You didn't know what you were doing? What does this say about our God? Let me ask you something. Did God make you to be happy on this life every moment? No. Did God make you to be comfortable on this life every moment? No. Do you have weaknesses that other people don't have? Yes. So, do we want to beat up somebody else for their weaknesses so that we can say we're okay? You better not because they look at you and say, look at the weakness that you've got. We're in this together, aren't we? But you know what I found about my weaknesses I get over? When my weakness comes up, the Bible says in my weakness, he's made strong. And if my weakness is taking me away from God, I have a choice. I can indulge my weakness, which doesn't make me stronger. It just makes my weakness stronger. Amen? Or I can take my weakness and say, God, I really feel like I want it this way in life. But I know that you're right here. We talked in the, in the uh, uh, study group this morning about he never leaves or forsakes us. Forsakes us. I can say, I can follow this weakness. Or I can decide that you're more important than how I feel this morning. I can take this weakness and, and make a decision. I can turn around and I can say, God, instead of indulging my weakness, I want to put my... I'm going to make the extra effort to show you I love you and say, I'm not going to indulge my weakness. I want you to smile. And I can put it on the offering. Amen? So someone who doesn't feel comfortable where they are and, and what they're doing and all those kind of things, they say, well, I can indulge my weakness. I can go uh, chase after drugs. I can chase after uh, sex outside of marriage. I can chase after the, the, the same sex. I can do those things. I can say, you know what? But you're worth more to me than any of those human feelings. And I'm going to lay it on the offers and offer to you because I want you to know I love you more than what is pulling me away from you. What kind of offering is that? People say, church wants your money? No, God wants you. And when you do that, you're offering yourselves to God. You're a living sacrifice. It's the most loving thing that you can do. Is that what our country's doing? Or is it saying, however you feel, just go do it and look for me. Amen? You say, but that's the government. Who picks the government? Who picks people that says, abortion is fine. Perversion is defined by God, not by narrow. It's fine. Oh, you don't need all of those rights and privileges. Just give up some of those because freedom's not important. Who gave us free will? 
Just let us take care of that for you. We'll take care of you. Who takes care of me? Who provides fresh grace daily? We have to be careful with those things. Or we wind up not living as godly people, responsible people, and, and people capable of saying, I can do it God's way. Or I can choose not to. And by the way, in our nation, you have every right to choose not to. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you do anything. He died to give you a choice. Amen? And you're responsible for your choice. Our job is, the church, is to help people, not manipulate people, not intimidate people, but to motivate people to see the best choice. Does that make sense? He, he, he listened. He says we're not to go out and, 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 and do the, the celebrating, feasting, and drinking that they indulge in pagan revelry. We can have a great time with the Lord, but not in pagan revelry, doing things that are against God's will. And we must not exchange in sex moral immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. 23,000. It would take about eight days of killing babies to make that many. But it's going to happen by when? Next week. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did die in snake bites. There was a time when they were griping about everything. And so he says, all you griping and complaining, he put snakes out there. You remember that? They said, well, what do we do? We're tired of griping about God. Now we want him to help us again. We were fine when we were just We sure felt powerful when we were telling God he didn't know what he was doing. But now the snake's here. We need God's help. What do we do? And Moses said, well, go make you an image of that snake that's biting you. Put it on a pole. And just look at it and you'll be saved. No, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be an antivenom. There's got to be a this. There's got to be a that. Maybe there's a seance or something. But something like this is no, you just look to that image of what's killing you on that pole. Then they can't sin for us on that cross. You can't work for the saving that he did for you. You look to him. What do I do when my weakness is pulling me the other way towards death? Remember the wages of sin is death? What do I do? You look to him. Amen? You look to Him. That's what you do. He said, don't put Christ to the test. Don't play that game. Don't play religion. This is real. This is important. This is eternal. Don't grumble as some of them did and then were destroyed by the angel of death. Miserable. On the earth so much they're grumbling all the time and they're grumbling against the Creator. God says, you're not of any use to anybody anymore. For the saved, you can call them home. For the others, he said, I'm not going to let you mislead people anymore. And the angel of death, judgment took place. <laughs> these things happen. Why? Why does it say up there? Why did these things happen? Examples for who? For us. God wanted to give us a warning. We can say, oh, what do I mean? God, we say, wow, God, thank you for showing me that. That's why I want to go the right way. Examples for us. Now let's go back to the end of chapter 9. And look what it says. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Everybody is running in this human race. Amen. Is everybody going to receive the prize in heaven? Everybody who makes Jesus Lord alive. Who does he want to win? He would have it that all would be saved. Right? Wide is the way to destruction, narrow is the way to heaven. You know why? So few people, it don't have to be wise. So few people are going to choose it. Brother Doug brought out the idea that says, you know what? The, the way is narrow, but there's no gate. The gate's wide open. Until when? Until the end, and then the gate's closed. But what a shame that, that it's wide open. Jesus died with his arms wide open. He said, not everybody's going to receive the prize. Run in such a way that you can get it. Choose the way. America won't be fixed by laws changing. America will be fixed by hearts changing. Everyone who competes for the prize is tempered of all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. We're not looking for something to say, look what I did today. Old trophies get rusty and then go away. I think I got a trophy once. Anyway, it's gone. Wasn't very good. It was probably a participation trophy. I've seen people get them big trophies, you know, but they go away. They're not there like, we're looking for one that will never go away. 
away. They said, in fact, that at that time they would win a wreath. And if you had that wreath, and if they put it on your head at the end of the games, like the Olympic Games or something, it was the equivalent of being knighted in England. A high place, and you never lost that place. That, that's the crown he's talking about. He said, we got one that goes on forever, a crown of righteousness. Therefore, I run this, not with uncertainty. He says, I'm not doing this wondering what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. Thus I fight, not as one who beats here. He says, I'm fighting. I'm not shadow boxing. This is not play. On 9-11, our country was at war. I'm sorry, we were in a war. We chose not to recognize we were in a war. And so the other side did what? They were fighting, we weren't. Hey, whatever you believe, whatever you feel, that's your business. As long as you're happy, we're happy. Meanwhile, they're mad as the Dickens. And what did they do? Whether you decide that this is a war or not, there's somebody warring against you. The enemy is warring against you. The enemy wants your children, wants your grandchildren. Did you know that? The enemy wants your witness not to be any good. The witness, the enemy says, hey, go do like everybody else. Just get along, do what you need to do, and all that. Because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. The enemy doesn't mind hurting your feelings at all. What happened? We were in a war, but we were not at war, and the enemy attacked us. The same thing happened at Pearl Harbor. About the same number of people were killed at Pearl Harbor. We were in a war. The whole world was in a war, and we were trying to kind of stay out of it and all that kind of stuff. And what happened? Pearl Harbor, they got hit. About 3,000 people died that day of our people. And it woke us up. What would it take to wake us up now? He says, I discipline my body and bring it to subjection. I say no to my weaknesses and I bring it to Jesus Christ and say, you're my Lord. I, su I subject myself to you and to your wisdom and to your way. Because your way offers eternal hope. My way takes me where? That wide way. You say, well, I'm a Christian. Girl. I can't lose my salvation. Well, first, if you're not following are you sure that he's Lord of your life? But you, you need to ask that question. Because if he's truly Lord, then absolutely I agree with you. But if you, if you just went through the motions and you didn't mean it near, and your life's not showing it, you may want to double check that. That's not to be ugly. I, I just don't see anybody in hell. Amen? But the other side of it is if I'm saved and I'm saying, hey, it's okay to say I follow Jesus to live over here. What am I telling the people around me? This Jesus guy, he's not all that important. He's not the way. Or the truth, but like, there's plenty of truths out there. There's plenty of other ways to get to heaven. That's a lie. There's one way to get to heaven. His name is what? Jesus. And my job is to show people that. So he says, I do what? I discipline my body and bring it to subjection, lest I have preached to others and I myself should be disqualified. No use anymore. I've lost the race. I'm going to be in it, dancing around a little bit, but, but I'm disqualified from winning because I'm not winning anybody else to the Lord. And I'm not a champion for the Lord anymore. I may be saved. He may say, Daryl, you're of no use to anybody down there. You're grounded. Come on on. The Bible says there's going to be a lot of people get to heaven, but as by fire, they barely got in. It smelled pretty smoky up there. You know, that kind of thing. I don't want my life wasted, do you? Do you want your life wasted while we're here? Do you have precious people that you don't want to see in hell? You're in a war. We battle not with the weapons of this world. We're not going out slapping people, intimidating people, hitting them over there with the Bible. We're called to use what? Genuine Christ-like love to show people. We're supposed to share the truth in love. But it has to be the truth. You can't be washed out so much they don't recognize it. We're not there to condemn people, but all of us do acts that would condemn us if we didn't have Jesus Christ. Amen? And we need to condemn them in ourselves and say, I'm going to put that on the altar. I'm not going to do that anymore because i got too much to lose. And you're worth it, Lord Jesus. You're worth it. Because you decided somewhere along the line, I was worth it. I was worth you giving up your life for me. And I can give that back. We need our eyes opened up. Would you agree with that as a nation? The Bible says this, if my people, which are called by my name, Christians, shall humble themselves, subject themselves, and pray and seek my face, and turn from the wicked ways, the pagan ways, the non-Christian ways, then I'll hear the Christ. 
then I'll, I'll hear. All the way from heaven, I'll be able to hear. Because if you kick me out, what am I to do? You have free will. You have choice. If you don't want me around, what do you have to do? It says, but I'll hear when, when you genuinely, from your heart, want me in a relationship with me. I'll hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sin, us individuals, and I will do what? Heal the whole land. Or not. He will. The question is, will we? Let's go to the Lord.